This is what one roboticist described of them. He said, quote, Asimov's laws are neat, but they're also BS. For example, they're in English. How the heck do I program that? The most important reason, though, why we're finding it tough to apply this very smart-seeming idea of ethics to these systems is that they're completely contrary to the way that we utilize these systems in our real world. You don't arm a Reaper drone with a Hellfire missile. You don't put a 50 caliber machine gun on a sword system to not harm humans. That's kind of the point of it. The same thing. You don't want a system that goes up to Osama bin Laden and takes orders from any human. You don't want him to be able to say, robot, turn yourself off. That's law number two. Law number three, I don't think we want robots with a survival instinct. One is we're sending them out there to be blown up so that you as future leaders don't have to write a letter home to someone's real world mother. Also, as an aside, you know, there's other parts of science fiction that give you an idea why you don't want robots with a survival instinct. If you don't know what it is, basically the movie, the fourth version of it's going to come out this summer, Terminator. You don't want robots with a survival instinct. So the point here is that the people who are paying for these systems, the people that are building these systems, don't want robots that can't kill, don't want robots that take orders from just anyone, and don't want robots that have that self-preservation instinct. The bigger issue, though, is when it comes to robots and ethics, we shouldn't be talking about the ethics of the machine itself, because it's a machine. It can't be moral by the very nature of it. We need to be talking about the ethics of the people behind the machines. So for example, what are the code of ethics for those who work in the robotics field? What is it ethical to build? What is it ethical not to build? What ethical code would a young roboticist turn to to have that question answered for them? It's not like the field of medicine where they have the Hippocratic Oath. Or another issue, who gets to use these systems and who doesn't get to use them? Is the Predator drone just a military technology that just military should have? If you think so, sorry, it's too late. The Department of Homeland Security already has six of them that they're flying domestically. How about local police forces? Should they be allowed to have these kind of sophisticated systems that were originally developed for war? Again, too late. The LA Police Department is right now purchasing a drone to have fly over high crime neighborhoods, basically park there and be the universal eye in the sky. I may think that's okay. There's a lot of crime in those neighborhoods. I may get a little more leery about it if that drone is over my neighborhood all the time. What about me? Is it my Second Amendment right? My right to have a robot that bears arms? These all sound like the kind of questions that you would ask at a science fiction convention again, but that's my very point. They may seem like what one um, Pentagon analyst described as, quote, mere science fiction, but robots are moving past that. They're becoming very real policy and ethical questions. Now, in conclusion, it sounds like I've been talking about the future of war. But notice how every picture you saw there wasn't like a system like the DDX or the F-35. They're already being used in war. They're already deployed. And so it's such a challenge before us, well before you have to worry about your Roomba ambushing you at night. It's the question, are we going to let the fact that these look like science fiction, sound like science fiction, feel like science fiction, keep us in denial that these are battlefield reality? Are we going to be like a previous generation that looked at another science fiction-like technology, the atomic bomb, which actually the name atomic bomb, the concept of it, comes from an H.G. Wells short story. Indeed, the very concept of the nuclear chain reaction also came from that same sci-fi short story. Are we going to be like that past generation that looked at this stuff and said, we don't have to wrestle with all the moral, social, ethical issues that come out of it until after Pandora's box is open? Now, I could be wrong here. And in fact, one scientist working for the Pentagon told me I was. said, there is no ethical or legal issues that come out of robots in war. Except he added this, quote, that is, unless the machine kills the wrong people repeatedly, then it's just a product recall issue. There's a lot to talk about, but I want to get to talking with you guys, so I'm going to end on this point. I'm actually going to jump into science fiction. A couple years ago, the American Film Institute, the AFI, gathered a list of the top 100 
Hollywood heroes and Hollywood villains of all time. So out of every single character in every single Hollywood movie, which ones, in their view, represented humanity at its best and humanity at its worst? Only one character made it onto both top 100 hero and villain lists. It was the Terminator, a robot killing machine. So what that shows to me is a duality, the duality of our technology. It can be used for both good and evil. But it also shows the duality of the people behind the machines. Because it's our human creativity that's distinguished us from every single other species. It's our human creativity that took our species to the moon. It's our human creativity that built works of art and literature and architecture to express our love and our brilliance. And now we're using our human creativity to build something extraordinary. And if you believe both the scientists and the science fiction writers, we may be even creating an entirely new species. But we're only doing it because we can't get past our age-old human need to destroy each other. So the real question is this. Is it our machines or is it us that's wired for war? Thank you. Sorry, third class ball. Sir, with the uh, growing dependence on these machines and the inherent strength of the autonomy that we can depend on, doesn't there, isn't there too an inherent weakness with that of uh, maybe an exposure uh, to cyber terrorism? Doesn't that turn against us greatly? It's a really great question because um, this is one of the, you often see these people that will talk about these RMAs, these revolutionary military affairs. And um, this is something that came out of the Rumsfeld era Pentagon. It's this arrogance that this revolution is the end. We've solved everything. We're actually, no, revolutionary technologies are just the beginning of the story. And you may get new capabilities, but you also get new vulnerabilities. So you hit on one of them, the high tech side of this. If you have a system that is dependent on controls from afar, a line of communication, then cutting that line of communication is a key vulnerability that everyone recognizes. And in fact, Iraqi insurgents have even started to jam our systems. What's interesting is actually fog of war, they're doing a pretty good job at it, but our own unintentional jamming is actually making it harder for the systems. We're actually jamming a lot of our own robots and making them not all that useful. There's another part of this um, is it's not just jamming, you open up with these systems an entirely new realm of war. Battles of persuasion. That is, I can't hack into your brain and convince you to stop fighting or to turn your weapon against your mate. With computers, I can hack and I can persuade that system to do things that the original owner might not want. But there's another side of this, and we need to remember, again, we're talking about these systems that are very advanced, but the wars that we're fighting in are ugly, messy, dirty. So on one hand, you pointed out a high-tech response to them, a high-tech vulnerability you can go at. But there's also a low-tech side. What's the most, uh, what is a very effective um, countermeasure against that sword system, that machine gun armed robot? As one guy put it, it's a six-year-old with a can of spray paint. Because think about it this way. You either have to be incredibly bloody-minded and shoot that six-year-old, even though they're unarmed or six years old, or they can walk up to your system, spray paint over the visual sensors, and they have just defeated your very sophisticated system. How do you deal with the ROEs on that? I actually posed that at um, Joint Forces Command, and it was kind of funny. Um, one of the officers then said, well, we can load it up with non-lethal non -lethal systems, and we'll tase that little six-year-old. <laughs> That is, that is their response. There's an inherent problem, though, then. 
you now uh, are going to, in the war of ideas, have that wonderful video clip going around of you tasing an unarmed six-year-old. Also, we of course know that it would probably cost a couple million dollars to add on that non-lethal system, and our very cheap disposable system is turned into, again, a technology race where we're fighting against, in the payment, the 99 cent you know, spray paint versus our multi-million dollar system right now. So, third class uh, you mentioned at the end of your speech uh, the duality, you know, the Terminator, both the good and the bad sides of it. But when you look at this, the, uh, the whole idea of robotics, it's kind of a scary thing seeing them evolve from what they, from what they were. But what's the difference between, say, the evolution of the gun and the evolution of these robots? Great question. It actually connects to, um, a lot of people pose that in terms of the different experience of the um, bomber pilots, what it's like you know, to be right above, you know, a mile overhead versus from being afar. How is that any different? It's the issue of risk, which is the duality, um, in that that bomber pilot, that person behind the gun, still is going to war. They are still exposing themselves to danger, even if it's out of distance, even if it's for a few brief moments, they're still on that same level of risk with those that they're targeting. It's a very different story, though, for that drone pilot who experiences no risk. It's, a, it's not just distancing, it's disconnect, both on a physical level, but also arguably on a psychological level. But there's another part of this which I think is very interesting, the questions that it poses for ethics. Because actually when gunpowder was first utilized, many of the people of the day described it as a cowardly technology that should be outlawed because you weren't fighting right up close. And the point here is that, again, you get these new technologies that present challenges to existing understandings. And these can be figured out, or these challenges, these different opinions can be very significant. So um, an example that's good for this crowd, submarine. Submarine was a technology that s was from the realm of science fiction, you know, Jules Verne and the like. And in fact, um, right before World War I, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, the writer of the Sherlock Holmes stories, writes a short story called Danger about the use of submarines to blockade Great Britain. This is in 1914. The British Admiralty goes public to mock Arthur Conan Doyle, says that is an absurd idea, and in fact, any officer that did so, use submarines in this way, would be shot by their own service. Of course, just a few months later, World War I starts, and the Germans actually do carry out a submarine blockade of Great Britain. Now what's interesting to me, though, is that it's a dispute over the laws of war as to how they relate to this blockade, as to how submarines should be utilized. A different interpretation between how the Germans thought was proper versus how we thought was okay, that actually leads the US to join World War I, that leads us to actually becoming a superpower. And so it's these questions of how you utilize these systems and the ethical issues behind them that can have major policy impact, and in fact, major impact on world history itself. Mr. Singer, sir, third class Stevens House, 25th Company. Uh, sir, any official policy on the ethical questions that you pose regarding robots, which seem to depend on getting concrete answers to questions of free will, philosophy of consciousness, and computational linguistics, do you see us getting absolute answers to those questions, or do you see us moving ahead on policy without concrete answers and possibly a divided, uh, sharply divided public on those answers? The short answer is the latter. Um, basically, we aren't wrestling with the issues that come out of these technologies. And um, it's the issue of um, uh, basically ignorance as a driver. And ignorance is used as, a, as an attack word sometimes, but it basically means to not be aware of what's happening right now. And um, there's a pretty good illustration of this that, that I've had is that um, I was giving a speech on this book tour. And um, afterwards, a very senior Pentagon um, person came up to me and said, I, I had no idea we were using this many of these robotic systems.